Remember the magic. It sure is nice to know that when things get a little scary, you can always count on your friends to make everything all right. Please use the self-service elevators for your trip to the Rocket Jet Flight Deck. W Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 506. And I'm here once again, not only to help you have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the parks, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with the podcast, videos, our blog, my live broadcast every Wednesday on Facebook, books, audio tours, special events, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. As we turn the page to 2018, we go from reflecting back on the year that was to setting our sights on what the future has in store. And this week, we're going to do just that as we explore the 10 things we're looking forward to in the Disney world in 2018. From the parks and resorts to movies, TV, and more, we'll discuss not just what we know is coming this year, but speculate on what else Disney and the future has in store. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have some updates, announcements, including information about upcoming Meet of the Month, some special events, your voicemails, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. I, I love that quote. I love that movie. And I love Edna Mode, who is as wise as she is talented. Uh, last week, we took a look back at the year that was for Disney. I, however, prefer um, in all respects and ways to move forward and to look ahead. And so this week, we're going to do just that as we set our sights on what the future has in store with 10 things we're looking forward to in the Disney World in 2018. And not just confined to Walt Disney World in Orlando. I also want to look at what's coming to other Disney parks around the world, as well as entertainment, movies, television, and more. And of course, I'm not the only one anticipating what is to come. And of course, looking ahead and doing a little speculating, which I think we'll do as well, is much more fun with friends. And so I invited some of my friends and members of the WW Radio Nation to join me this week. And as always, chivalry is not dead, ladies. I still believe in ladies first. My dad raised me right. I am going to go ladies first. And I want to welcome, I think, to the first time on the show... Mrs. Allie Miller? Yes. It is. It's you are a... Uh, and it's funny because you are a longtime friend. You are a member of the running team. I would say a fellow theater nerd, but I haven't been a theater m- nerd in quite some time. You never quite lose it, though. So once you're in the club, you're always in. Fortunately, uh, when I was in the club, there was no... F- video on your phones and live streaming and the grease tape will never see the light of day uh also joining me and i just realized back to back weeks uh you've gone from zero to many shows and a lot uh mrs lisa denoto glasner you joined us for your look for the look back in 2017 I, I believe you said you wanted or expected or demanded to be on the 2018 show so <laughs> welcome back Thank you for having me. <laughs> they weren't back to back. I think there was a Becky episode in between. There might have been. Yeah, there, there might. Okay, so I feel better. But yeah, so thank you for having me back means you're lucky you're having me back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the person who is with us um, farthest from the home base, uh, definitely a first time uh, show participant, is Mr. Chris Blagg from the United Kingdom. Hello. Cheers, my friend. Good to see you. And you. So So before we even get started, I will tell you, um, when I put the call out to do the show, I was so excited. You jumped in so quickly. I almost pulled back the invitation when I was looking through some things. Just correct me if I'm wrong. You still have never seen Star Wars? I have now seen episode four. 
I saw that last week, but that is the only one I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to work through. And and I'm I was nervous again for a second because when you said I've only seen, if you would have said episode one, two, or three, the connection might have been accidentally disconnected. Well, that, that's it. I, I asked a lot of people, and and starting with four is the way to go. Apparently, definitely. And you just just watch four, five, six, and maybe Last Jedi, and you're good. Um, so, real quickly, when since you are in the UK, I wanted to ask you when was your first time to Walt Disney World, and how often do you get to visit? Uh, my first time I was 11, that makes it 1990. Um, so it was, I'm uh, 90 or 91. So the, the studios had uh, just opened, uh, for my first time and I, I get there most years. Nice. Cause or I know for a, most people in the UK, it's yeah. one every couple of years. Um, also I, I think again, I think first time uh, on the show, uh, you were going to join us last week or, or when we did the 2017 recap because you made such a compelling argument in the WW Radio Nation group um, because you wore LuLaRoe leggings at Momentum and you felt that that was a 2017 worthy moment. I want to welcome Keith Groshans to the show. Hey, Lou. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm sure you wish, like me, that there was no video. Or maybe you're happy that there's video of you wearing LuLaRoe leggings after Momentum. Yeah, that is, uh, there's video out there and it's fine. It's, uh, you know, I own it. It's a, just to be clear, for those of you thinking about coming to Momentum 2018, that was not an officially sanctioned event. <laughs> that was something you guys did uh, completely on your own. And uh, tuning, joining us live from arguably my favorite city in these United States, New Orleans, Louisiana, Mr. Jimmy Swoop. Nice to see you as well. Great to see you, Lou, and thank you for having me. Thank you as well. So you are uh, a little bit closer than Chris. How often do you get out to Walt Disney World? Um, probably once every six months. I've been four times in the last 13 months. boy. So it was time to buy the annual pass, and I actually jumped in and did it in December and never going to look back. And now that you have people. it, you almost have to come more often because it's almost like wasting money if you don't. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, and it makes it that much easier because you're like, oh, all I got to do is get my room. That's easy. There you go. You know. Uh, all right. So very quickly then, um, especially for those of you who are new, what is your – we'll get to the important question. I won't even ask you things like your favorite park or your favorite movie. What's your favorite place to eat in Walt Disney World, Jimmy? Oh, Tepanito. Easy. Because nice. every time we go, we have to go. Are, are you a sushi food. guy? Am I what? A sushi guy. No, unfortunately not. My little sister wants me to be, but I just can't do it. <laughs> I'll like, help for some you. if you need any sort of uh, indoctrination to, into that. Uh, Chris Blagg, favorite favorite restaurant at Walt Disney World? Uh, it's a tough one. There's so many, but I'm, I'll go with, in, in Italy, I'll go with Tef, um, Tefi, uh, Tito Gusto. Very nice. Keith? For me. Uh, new leader in the clubhouse is Sana. Nice. It's nice. With a little asterisk for... Late night Sanaa Lounge bread service. Yeah, that's the one. Allie Miller? It's a tie between Homecoming and Sanaa for me. Yeah, you know what? Uh, the judges will actually allow that because of the two that, that you let tied. Uh, <laughs> Lisa, I want to answer for you. <laughs> 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 Lisa has still not been to the Boathouse, and that's all my fault. But other than Boathouse, what is your favorite restaurant at <laughs> Walt Disney World? I, I wasn't even going to mention it. Um, no, it's just depending on my mood, um, Morimoto or Homecoming, if I want sushi or good fried stuff. Nice. Nice. Again, all things that uh, – this is why we're friends, because we bond over food. But as we start looking forward to 2018, I think there's a lot to be excited about. Um, and that's why I wanted to – expand the the scope of the conversation beyond just Walt Disney World because I think as Disney fans there's now so many more things that fall under the Disney umbrella um, whether we travel to other parks around the world or just enjoy some of what is on TV in the movies on Broadway wherever your heart may lie so I want to go again around the horn because there really is no right or wrong answer but I'm actually curious um, as to some of the things that you are most excited about. And that's why I didn't sort of 
uh, propose a list and then we discuss it. I want to hear from you what has you, because what might be most exciting to you might be different than somebody else in the group. So I will go ladies first as well. And Allie, because you are, <laughs> her eyes just widened open, really, me. Um, because you are new, I, I want to know what is um, either the, the first thing or the highest thing, however you want, you've organized your list. What was that first thing that you thought of in terms of, what you're most excited about for 2018, what you're most looking forward to. So I've seen Disney kind of heading in this direction for a couple of years now, and I'm really excited to see what new and interesting add-on experiences they devise for your trips to the park. Um, I think there have been rumors about some new ways to experience attractions and um, tours and resort upgrades and that sort of thing and i think that there's going to be some really cool things that people can do coming up pretty soon so uh, this is almost more of a prediction for what you think might be coming um when you say add-on experiences do you mean things that are going to happen in the parks or resorts do you mean uh, uh ticketed uh or additional cost add-on experiences or some sort of hybrid uh, probably a hybrid, but I think that they that the trend has certainly been that that these are all separately ticketed events. And so, do you like that? Do you like having and and all of you can actually chime in on this um, because you know now there are so many opportunities. Whether it's a very merry Christmas party, not so scary Halloween party. I know some of you who are DVC members uh, get to participate in things like Moonlight Magic. Um, do you like having these? optional add-on ticketed events or do you find that you prefer you know the parks just stay open later for everybody and anybody is feel free to chime in i think if if i take that one my my experience of them is is generally great for the things like not so scary for the things like very merry christmas where there are lots and lots of dates um, so you have lots of opportunity, certainly if, like me, you, you live a long way from the parks, to get to go to some of those events. When are the kind of the, the short things? So like the studios, I know, have a, a few um, kind of one or two day events. They're much more difficult to get to. So, you know, those are the ones that I, I think are great. We get to live through them with, with the videos. But um, I, I really enjoy the, the, the long ones that I get to go to. Yeah, I think the DVC events that they've been offering have been really great. I went to one at the Magic Kingdom um, this week that was, it It was just amazing to um, be able to be in the park, sort of like in the old days where it wasn't packed, crowded. I mean, you, we, I walked up five minutes before the fireworks start, started and could have made snow angels in the hub, <laughs> um, which was pretty amazing. Um, so I, I think things like that are great. And I, I like that, you know, a lot of times they're offered after hours. So it's not like you're closing the park down early to other guests. Um, but I also like, you know, like, like Chris said, a lot of the, um, the ticketed events, like the not so scary and the the Christmas party. Um, when I was traveling here as a non-local, it was always nice to know that I had that one night where there wouldn't be lines in the, you know, in the park, you know, as much as usual. And it, I, I kind of knew that, you know, if we didn't catch certain things that were favorites of my kids, um, that we would have the opportunity to kind of walk on the rides and, and have a unique experience one of the nights that we were there. But then you don't you don't have to do it. You know, it's it, it's pricey, but um, you know, but but if you want to take advantage, you can. I agree, Lisa. As a DVC member myself, I don't get a chance to get to a lot of the uh, extra parties and stuff from being you know too far north. Um, but it's nice to know they have them. There's a lot of good things they do have. And last time we visited, uh, which was a year or so ago, um, we twisted my arm. I didn't want to do it, but we did it. It turned out to be a great experience. It was one of the morning magics, and. You know, things like that were unexpected ways. We, a lot of us are, go to the parks often enough in our careers going, you know, back so far that these are new ways to experience it and to freshen up our park experience and to, you know, just give us little different ways to experience the park we wouldn't have otherwise done. I completely agree. And I, and also the backstage tours really enable you to to pick and choose what you're interested in. I took my kids on one that was about animal care at animal kingdom. And it was really, it was really great for them because we got to focus our time on something that we wouldn't normally get to see, but that was very, very close to their heart and what they were wanting to know more about. 
Yeah, and I'll um I'll weigh in at the end with some predictions that I have, and and Ali, I think I might touch on a little bit of something that you are alluding to. Um, Lisa, what is what is one of or your top things that you are looking forward to in the the overall Disney World coming in twenty eighteen? Um, so setting aside the obvious, like things that are literally coming in 2018, I think that the thing that I'm you know most excited about in the coming year is what we didn't get last year, which was more detail on some of the developments that they're working on, particularly for me, Epcot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, we're not going to see a lot of it until, you know, maybe 2021 for the 50th. Um, but I, I'm just so excited to you know, not just hear more about, you know, Ratatouille and Guardians of the Galaxy, but also the reimagining of Future World and, you know, the various festivals that they're doing so much with now. Um, World Showcase obviously has, you know, a lot coming, even though we don't, you know, have official official details on that yet. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to maybe getting what I was very hungry for last year, which is, you know, more more details on the, the reimagining of, of Epcot in general. Yeah, and I think we all sort of agree that that it's a it's it's uh, silently understood that what we got at D twenty three Expo in twenty seventeen was, in my opinion, scratching the surface of what is coming to and for Epcot Center in the next few years. I think to your point, Lisa, we will start to see a slow roll of announcements of what is coming to Epcot. I don't necessarily expect it to come in one fell swoop of a grand announcement, but I think the handwriting is on the wall in terms of what we see, what we don't see. Uh, Even right now, space that is and is not being utilized that might have been so in the past, I think to me is an indicator of some additional uh, changes and more importantly, improvements that are coming to a park that we love and has such a place in our, in our hearts, but uh, one can argue um, could use a little bit of love. And I think that's going to be coming. I think it's going to be coming in in waves and I think bigger and grander than people expect. Uh, I've said it since Expo. If you think that what was announced at Expo was the only thing that's coming to Epcot Center, I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised. And I think if, like me, you are a futurist who's also, you know, has one foot in the past and a nostalgic, I think that is not going to be lost um, in terms of of what is coming. Um, and if I'm, if you can tell that I'm Riley smiling, I might be just a little bit. So, um, because I am one of those people who is incredibly fond of Epcot and incredibly excited for what we know and what I think might be uh, might be coming in the future. Anybody else thoughts on Epcot? Something you'd like to see? Something that you're excited to see? That was on my thinking? list too. Actually, I was. I'm really excited for anything that they do to freshen up Epcot because, like you, I think it's more beautiful parks and there's a whole lot of really interesting things in there. And I'd like to see them put things in there that bring more people to experience that. So just for a point of discussion, you want to, you said you want to see them bring things in to Epcot that will bring more people into Epcot. So I think if I'm interpret that correctly, you feel that Epcot could use some, some love that sometimes is a point of discussion and contention for some Disney fans, because sometimes bringing new things into Epcot one means that some old things, some old favorites have to go away. And two, and I think more importantly, when we talk about new things that are being brought into the parks, a lot of time the discussion turns to do you leverage a popular Disney intellectual property, something that's um, really trending on TV, a movie that is a huge hit, or do you prefer um, – uh, completely new and unique things that are ba- that are that are not based on those because you can argue both ways. If you want something to be an immediate attractor, you put Frozen in, you put The Incredibles in, you put you know Marvel in, or do you want them to go back to you know? Remember, originally Epcot was all unique IP. I mean, the the characters and the attractions that were created for Epcot were created for Epcot. They weren't based on anything else. And again, I'd like to hear anybody's thoughts on, as Epcot, we expect or hope to grow and change in 2018 and beyond. Do you care if they use 
existing IP? Does it does it bother you? Do you want them to do something unique, or can it be a combination of both? I think they've been really tasteful with how they've done it so far, and I the decisions that they've made and the steps that they've taken with some of the Epcot specific characters and IP um, tell me that they're sensitive to how attached people are to those characters as they develop in other places. I mean, Figment is the thing that, you know, pops out to me the most. I mean, we don't know what's happening with imagination, but they clearly understand that Figment holds a huge place in, um, you know, in, in our hearts and, and, and whatever happens with, with imagination going forward. Um, <laughs> no, but, but they know the character holds a place in our hearts and you see him everywhere. Now he has a huge presence in the festivals. Um, you know, the painting, the mural that they're doing is, is, you know, for a festival, of the arts is figment focused. He's everywhere. So you, you can tell that they understand that while they're moving forward and maybe bringing in some elsewhere existing IP um, that people love that at the same time they should, you know, that they're they're honoring the characters that are that are Epcot specific. So I'm not a purist. I, I love Guardians. I have no problem with Guardians coming in, but at the same time, like I'm heartened to see that they understand that the Epcot specific characters are, you know, deserve their own place. Look, Figment has risen like the Phoenix over the last few years, and that is that is no accident. Um, yeah. if you think that Disney does not listen to guests and feedback and surveys and the internet and Twitter. Clearly, Figment is the greatest indicator. And I will tell you that if you think Figment being no longer on the backside of Spaceship Earth, but at the very front, as soon as you walk in the park, is Mm -hmm. a a happy accident, I say nay nay. Um, I I, I think that um, Figment being... Uh, not just a, a mascot, but the icon and the embodiment of that park, because I think he is everything that Epcot stood and continues to stand for. It's imagination, it's innovation, it's creativity with a little bit of childlike whimsy that Epcot did not have originally. So I think he is the um, the, the perfect character to represent what I think is going to be an ongoing change and growth and expansion to Epcot Center. Um, I, I've talked a little bit about what I think is coming in the past, and I, for one, am incredible. As much as I've loved what has happened to Disney's Animal Kingdom and the expansion of Fantasyland and, and certainly what is coming to Disney's Hollywood Studios, I think little you know Lou Mangiello, when he first visited Epcot in 1982, is probably most excited for what I don't know is coming to Epcot Center, if that, make, if that makes any sense. And to know that Peter Quill was probably there at the same time. Oh, my God. I love it. <laughs> I love every part of that. I love every part of that. It all ties in together. And I think it's going to even tie in, in more so uh, going forward. So, um, Chris, what, what's one thing or the, the thing that you are most looking forward to um, in the Disney World in 2018? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring it closer to home, I think. For, for me, it's it's the Marvel superheroes in Paris um, that, uh, that we're going to be getting in the studios. Um, this is a, it's a massive, massive deal for us in uh, who, who call the, you know, the, the, the Paris parks our home parks. And um, it, it's a park that needs a lot of help. And we're really starting to see things happen now. Uh, in in the studio, so you know we've 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 had confirmed Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Spider Man, um, Black Widow. Everybody is is coming to the uh, to the parks in Paris. Um, with we don't know the details yet, but certainly meet and greets, and uh, there, there's been some show elements as well. So I'm I'm really excited for that. And there's the the Marvel theming of the already existing New York Hotel, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's probably been put off till uh, till 2019, um, but that's definitely coming as well. And that's you know really again really needs to happen, and that's that's super exciting. And I think that the decision to move that back is incredibly deliberate and very strategic, <laughs> based on some things that have recently happened and are continuing to happen in the Disney Marvel. You know, here's you know. $56 billion, give me everything in Fox, including all of our Marvel characters back deal. Um, so uh, 
everything is happening uh, very much so for a reason. Um, is there yeah, any more? Yeah. So as somebody who has not been to the the Paris Park as yet, <laughs> possibly in 2018, um, <laughs> Becky's not here. I can say whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> is there any Marvel presence in the parks currently? Yeah, there's a little bit. So there's been a Meet Spider-Man um, meet and greet for a, a couple of years now. Um, but that's been about it. Um, they, they've they kind of have uh, they've done some special events. So when it, for the 21st anniversary um, last year, they they had a, a, a massive um, cache of characters in in the main park um, for their kind of special event. But that was a one off. Um, but I, I think we can start to. We're, we're certainly hoping that all the things that are being rumored for Disney's California Adventure and their their Marvel area. We're, we're hoping we're going to get that in Paris as well. So very quickly, you said that there was a um, uh, a meet and greet with Spider Man. Is it mm-hmm. the nineteen you know sixty two version of comic book Spider Man, or is it the more modern um, you know film version of, of Spider Man? Because the, because yeah. right now you know there's there because of what the deal has been with Universal, especially east of the Mississippi, the characters that they are able to use and license is, are, are only ones from the comics, not ones that you'll find in Homecoming, which, as we talked about, I think, on the 2017 show, is a little bit of a disconnect, especially for younger guests who might not be as into the comic books as they are the familiarity with the characters on TV or in the movies. Yeah, we, we have the new one. Um, so it is. It is the movie version. Um, Wait a minute! I, I, you I, had a yeah. Spider-Man Homecoming meet and greet in Paris, and nobody told me. <laughs> it, it's not specifically Homecoming, but it, it is. It is definitely the the newer film film versions of uh, of Spider-Man, um, rather than that that old old uh, comic book version. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's been there for a couple of years. They have a a proper meet and greet building for it and, and everything now. Well, and I think when I was talking about, you know, let's sort of just stick to Marvel for a second because in in one of the things that, you know, when I was thinking about my speculations and predictions for 20, 2018 going forward, the first thing I put on my list was just six letters and it just said Marvel um, because I do anticipate and I'm excited for what I think are going to be some relatively monumental out of left field announcements for Disney and Marvel specifically in the domestic parks um, quickly around the horn for anybody who has a, you know, a, a strong opinion one way or the other is Marvel something that you would like to see brought into the existing domestic parks as they stand today. So California adventure, the four parks in Disney world, or does it need to exist elsewhere? Um, thoughts one way or the other. Yeah, I could. I would love to see more Marvel. You know, I think you know Disney World has a uh, a princess perception. You know, sometimes you know a lot of people say, "Well, you know, it's a princess kind of park." Well, I mean, I think Star Wars and Marvel destroys. You know, bringing that in would really kind of help up that. You know, the quality of that. So if I said, "Okay, Keith, we have concepts for two or three Marvel-based attractions," Lou Mangello raved about the interactive uh, experience in Hong Kong Disneyland. We want to bring some of those things out here to Walt Disney World. Where should we put them? Well, I think the first part is the studios. If we have the space, that's the problem. That's now coming, that's becoming, uh, between Star Wars and Toy Story, will become a mega park. Um, But I think you could put them, I mean, Epcot, of course, Future World, Tomorrowland, um, you know, places like that could house it depending upon the concept. So I, I want to play devil's advocate because when you said Epcot, I am pr- I am anticipatorily hearing the screams of people saying, my God, what are you insane, man? I'm having a tough, I'm having a coronary bringing Guardians of the Galaxy into Ellen's, you know, wacky universe of energy adventure. How well, can you, you bring Marvel there? Sorry? You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> So <laughs> some people did. Um, and then what do you replace? You know, if you bring it into some place like the studios, what do you start to take away? And do you create a Marvel themed land? Do you do overlays for attractions? Do you do to Twilight Zone Tower of Terror here what you did, what you did to Twilight Zone Tower of Terror out in Disney California Adventure? 
Jimmy is shaking his head. No, no, <laughs> because I think each one has its own individuality. I mean, you, instead of bringing it over from California, leave power as it is and create new new aspects for people to enjoy here, whether it is in the studios or whether it is in Epcot. But I think having a Marvel presence would be huge just because of how big Marvel has been with the younger generation with the movies and older generation as well, because people are being pulled in with all these movies. And for me, that would be a great combination of the old and the new if they can be able to do that in a way that they're not getting rid of everything that makes us love Disney and Disney World so much. And that's the tricky balance. And that's the thing that I think they've done wonderfully to this point. But I think you just got to try it lightly when it comes to that. Just don't bring it all in at once. Bring it a little by little. And and that's the delicate balance, right? Because everybody – now that we – we, right? Like I own it. Now that we <laughs> own everything under the Marvel Universe, as it were, we are you know lining up at the gates anticipating we want a Marvel presence in the parks sooner rather than later. What happens is it becomes a double-edged sword because if you want it quicker, something has to go away. Because if you want it to come in soon, it needs to take over the place or an existing building that's already there. Now you start to chip away at the nostalgia, at the things that people love. And like when Frozen came into Epcot, there was, you may or may not have heard it, a little bit of discussion about bringing um, Frozen into World Showcase. So do you sacrifice the speed and the immediacy of wanting something quickly with, we're going to bring Marvel in, but it's going to take us five to seven years to build an expansion to a park to, you know, I don't think a fifth gate is coming in five years, or to build something that is specifically geared towards Marvel, but it's going to take, you know, much longer to do so. I'm not the kind of person who is always a fifth fifth park kind of person, because I think the typical vacation is stretched far enough as it is. Um, but I could make a case that now with Fox and Marvel that there's there's opportunity for a fifth park. I'm still not a fan of a fifth park, but there's no denying, too, that there is some capacity that the the parks could expand because of, you know, there is no slow season anymore. There is no, you know, a lot of that has been um, kind of stretched out over the course of a full year. And I think that, you know, loosening the belt a little bit on some of the uh, parks to include a new land with with a Marvel flair. People will wait for that. I think, you know, there's, there's, I wouldn't tread on the nostalgia that they have because now you're running out of things that are, you can replace. And so I think, you know, I think there's a little loot, uh, there's a notch in the belt that we could kind of open up. And yeah, I think, like, short of putting a 50 character meet and greet into Stitch's Great Escape, we're kind of running out of space. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and so, so that's the thing too. So if you were to take that even further, okay. We're running out of space in the existing parks. There is still a little bit of space that you that I believe they could expand in Magic Kingdom. Will Marvel fit thematically with that? Possibly not. So if you start to sort of, you know, uh, pull at this thread a little bit further and you start talking about what would become a massive undertaking. And when you say massive undertaking, you have to put the word financial in there as well. Well, now all of a sudden, the price of poker is going to go up. The ticket Mm -hmm. prices are going to go up. Prices for annual passes are going to go up. And again, there comes sometimes that pushback. Well, you know, my ticket prices are going up. It's becoming more and more expensive. Now Disney World is not as accessible to everybody because the prices are going up. I, I personally don't believe that because I think hour for hour, minute for minute, it's an incredible entertainment value, but a separate conversation for a separate day. Um, and again, we can continue to to pull at that thread and, and you know, unravel that sweater of, of wanting to bring more in the cost and the time and the, when I say expense, I don't necessarily mean just financial expense, but expense in terms of what might have to go away in order to make room for, you know, the the Deadpool roller coaster. Oh, my God, a Deadpool roller coaster would be awesome. Um, I think something that people need to consider, though, is that we tend to get all dramatic about things when they close them. But if we really take a careful look, is it something we do every time? I mean, was anybody going to Stitch's Great Escape? Not so. Well, I am chaining myself here. to no. the fast pass booth. Right? When the- <laughs> you know, and 
I mean, maybe it's just because I'm in, unencumbered by the nostalgia of the 70s and 80s because I didn't get to Disney World till 2004. But I just feel like we have to trust that Disney is going to do the right thing by the majority of its guests. And that if they take something away that we love, they're going to add something that we are going to also love. And if we get past the emotional response, I think we might actually find that we we're OK with it. And that, in addition to our love of tacos, is why we are friends, because I, I agree with you 100 <laughs> percent. You know, taking away Stitch's Great Escape, uh, closing um, down, you know, Flights of Wonder is is markedly different than we're shutting down Haunted Mansion, you know, for a, right. uh, you know, right. um, a home on the range attraction. So <laughs> I tried to think <laughs> the most obscure, not loved movie in Disney. Of course, there's one guy. It's like, I wish it was a home on the range attraction. Um, a black Cauldron comes black, to Haunted Mansion. <laughs> listen, I think there's still some people who would love a Black Cauldron um, attraction somewhere. So, Jimmy, what there about for you? be a Gurgis. A Gurgis, Gurgis Munchies and Crunchies. Look at you. Gurgis Munchies and Crunchies was in Fantasyland. Yeah. I know. Not many people Does anyone knew. miss that? I don't think so. <laughs> no. I, I, well, I missed some of the French fry, the pot roast mac and cheese, but. Oh, you hit a nerve so, there. So, I know. Because I had that. That was at the Friar's Nook. That... Which is where Gurgis Munchies and Crunchies used to be. Oh. Um... Way back when. But so you Actually, at one point, that was food. known as the Village Fry Shop, and all they sold was French fries. That was my I'm favorite back. e-ticket attraction. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, what about for you? What What's something or the one thing that you are most looking forward to in 2018? Well, it, it's kind of obvious, but with Toy Story, not so much the land itself opening, but how that's going to affect everything else when it comes to other parks and their flow as far as visitors going to whether it's flight of passage or whether or not it's going to uh, mine train or something like that how much is that actually going to pull from other parks to see is it going to actually make it a full one-day park again or is that going to have to wait till 2019 um i'm, I'm kind of interested to see how that works and how that incorporated with the current ride that it is there now i want to see how that all flows plus i would just love to see the land how it is just because that's one of my favorite movies. So I want to see how that, that whole land opens up and what it affects to all the other parks. But the other, th that's not the thing I'm looking forward to the most. And this is outside the parks, but I'm actually, I love how you snuck one in, man. That's a total Lou yeah. Angelo move. I, I had to, I had to, <laughs> the, the thing I'm looking forward to the most is actually infinity war. I mean, that's, I, I think that <laughs> in four coming next year is just going to be, it's just going to be a game changer. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to see how they're going to play that. And that goes back to the Marvel bringing everybody in with Marvel because everybody's so excited for that movie, which in turn makes them think of Disney as well and right. wants them to go to the park and see how that is with the park. So that's the thing I'm really looking forward to. So let's just quickly touch on, on both that you snuck in there. You know, with Toy Story Land uh, coming in, Sometime this summer, um, there's been speculation uh, that would it would open for uh, May 1st, which would be the anniversary of MGM Studios. I'm not sure they want to sort of marry themselves to that date and be locked in. I think we would expect it possibly later on in the summer. But I think you're right in terms of what is going to be the impact, how great or how ne negligible potentially is that impact going to have on an attraction like Flight of Passage? You're going to have the Slinky Dog Dash, the alien uh, coaster attraction there. Uh, I think for a lot of people, they think Toy Story Land uh, definitely skewing towards a younger demo as opposed to Flight of Passage, what might be skewing to uh, a more uh, an older one. But you, look, with every, every new thing that opens, you're right, it does sort of thin the herd um, a little bit more. You had me at Infinity War. I looked over. Lisa literally threw up, up her arms in in uh, in a sense of absolute and utter joy. <laughs> I am sure that she and I are not the only ones who are excited um, about. Uh, look, and that's not the only Marvel film um, that that's coming out this year. But I think oh. in I think that you're right. Infinity War is about to usher in a whole new chapter and a whole new level in the Marvel universe that's going to open up some massive floodgates. And, you know, timing being everything with the acquisition of the Fox deal, uh, I believe this is, I don't know if this is confirmed or not, that they, you know, already were casting a, a character for Wolverine. 
to join in. So the uh, you know the ink wasn't dry on the paper yet when they were already starting to think ahead how we can leverage these film these new these characters that now we own and the opportunities that they present and I think that is what you know Infinity War is going to be a game changer in the Marvel universe not just for the Marvel fans but I think for theme park fans um, as well as the 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 movie fans too uh, anybody else thoughts on Infinity War. God, this the the flash scene where they look over at the guardians and say, "Who the heck are you?" I, I, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> and I'm gonna. I, I will assume that you were probably not a, a comic book book nerd sitting on your front stoop, you know, reading stacks of comic books when you were 12 years old. No, I wasn't. No, good guess. <laughs> right, but but so the 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 point of that was that yeah. I think what has been happening with. The recent films, I think, especially with Guardians and and uh, even the Avengers films, it has made you know the non comic book fans, comic book movie fans. Um, you know, comic books used to be the thing that nerds like me used to go and do and and you know read when we didn't have dates when we were seventeen and eighteen. But all of a sudden, it's cool to be a comic book fan again. And now, I think the way Disney has positioned the films, making them especially films like Guardians. Um, and even Thor Ragnarok, um, so much more family friendly and accessible. It now is something that the entire family is uh, excited for and into as well. And we sort of use we've been using Infinity War as sort of the the keystone for the Marvel Cinematic Universe in 2018. But that's not all that's coming. I mean, we can sort of talk about movies just a little bit uh black panther is just weeks away and with every new trailer that's released i'm more and more excited about it the first yeah. one i was like yikes is this time that it, is it a swing and a miss and now all of a sudden I, you know i want to go and and get a my parents went to wakanda and all i got was this crummy t-shirt shirt um <laughs> infinity war comes out may 4th i don't care if it's not being put out by disney deadpool 2 comes out May 18th. Uh, I added that to the list after the Fox deal because I think Deadpool 2 and all the things that surround that now with the Disney Fox deal um, has additional implications, right? Because the New Mutants, which was supposed to be coming out uh, this year, is now coming out in February 2019, uh, which moved Deadpool earlier to when it was supposed to be released instead of a little bit later in May um, Gambit has been delayed, and I think X Men Dark Phoenix is currently in production. Once the ink, once the deal is done, and I would expect, you know, it, it would take probably until next February or March before the Fox deal is finalized. We wonder what other um, implications that might have. Uh, Ant Man and the Wasp is coming out in July. Um, Venom, which again is not. Technically Disney, but he's a. I, I mentioned Venom because obviously I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. But the Tom Hardy starring starring Venom is a Sony part. Of, it's part of the Sony universe. So there's almost sort of these two weird Spider-Man universes out there um, on screen coexisting at the same time, and I don't know how that is going to resolve. Uh, and there's actually there is going to be a Spider-Man full-length animated film called Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse that comes out in December 2018. Uh, Again, that's Sony animation. It's not Disney. Um, And the guys who are working on the Han Solo movie actually moved over to that. So it'll be... um, It'll be interesting to see how all these different characters, all these different storylines play into one another. Uh, Any other... Marvel films that you guys have on your radar, super excited for. I think Allie you Miller, all Allie Miller has no idea who any of those characters are. Dude. I don't know <laughs> what any of those words mean. I I had to say I'm not a comic book movie guy either, so I'll I'll disconnect, but we can still be friends. Like, the Nutcracker <laughs> is coming out. I'm the Nutcracker is that. coming out, um, but it stars Doctor Doom, so it's going to be a little bit of a new take on the, the Nutcracker. <laughs> Yeah, but it's got the ballet, and I just I think that the choreography has some really good potential, and 
dancers that they've cast are incredible. And if they redo Fantastic Four in a musical Nutcracker, they can finally get a Fantastic Four <laughs> movie correct, which they have not been able to I, do since. I think as well, while we're on movies, um, it, for me, just because I'm in the UK, Friday, Coco. I, I haven't seen that yet because that's not out here in the UK yet. So, so that's that's was on my list as one of the things I'm most looking forward to in 2018. Bring I tissues. forgot like the space time continuum in the UK is very yeah. different than it is here. But uh, then looking at my list, it looks like we get Infinity War before you do because we have that in April. You do? Yeah. I'm moving my UK <laughs> trip up by a few. Weeks. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. Yeah. Um, and not to spoil it for you, but I'm sure that there's a few people on this call who would agree that you're going to love Coco. Bring tissues. Bring all bring, the tissues. I have, I have tickets already. Uh, bring it's tissues and tacos yeah. is the best yeah. advice that I can give you. Because you'll be, you will be, uh, in, a, in a lovingly way, you'll be sad and hungry by the time. At least I was. I don't really know why you were hungry in that movie. Because hungry. there was no tamales. There were so many tamales. Oh, tamales. All the tamales. Did you miss the big tamale <laughs> dance number? Um, yes, I did. I wanted Mexican food so bad after I wiped the tears uh, away from what was left of my popcorn. So, um, but yeah, I, look, as a, as a Marvel fan, I'm super excited for the fact that we have one, two, you know, there's three Disney films that are coming as well as other characters that are coming from some of the other studios. And it'll be interesting to see how they contrast and or converge at some point um, in film. And then what that will potentially mean for, um, for us in the theme parks. Um, what about the, uh, the animated? We have uh, Wreck-It well, Ralph. Say, let, maybe this is a good time to talk yeah. about some of the yeah. other films that are going to be coming out in 2018 and maybe we'll sort of do in the same order is there a film or films that you are really looking forward to that's coming out ali um just i mean mostly i'm i'm most excited for the nutcracker is that the nut ca- nutcracker and the four realms in november that's right. it's kind of a retelling but i think it's going to make dance much more accessible to the audience than it has been so not for, a lot of people go to the theater and see the full like, ballet. Right. So for those who maybe aren't familiar about what that film is and how it's going to differ from um, maybe the Nutcracker that we're familiar with, do you know you know any details about? You said it's sort of a, is it is it a more modern retelling? I think they've revamped the story a bit from what I can tell um, from the ballet, but um, they've made it a little darker. And more along the lines of the new Beauty and the Beast, I think it's the same group that did the Beauty and the Beast. It has that same sort of feel when you watch it. So, I, I think the the biggest takeaway from Nutcracker and the Four Realms, I have four words for you, and they are Kira Knightley, Morgan Freeman, and those yeah, are those are two around. those are two big reasons to love that film. If you know nothing else about it, um, having those two in there. Um, but again, I think it's interesting that you say that because that is not one that seems to get the most uh, attention or discussion. There's a lot of talk about um, A Wrinkle in Time coming in a few weeks and, and some of the other animated films that are coming. Um, I don't want to take any away from anybody. So, Lisa, what, what's the film that you're most looking forward to? Um, I mean, other than Infinity War, um, we're Incredibles fans here. So I'm super incredible, um, excited for Incredibles 2. Um, but I, other than, again, Infinity War, I'm most excited for the live action Mulan that's coming out in, I think, November of this year. Um, I was a huge fan of Cinderella. It's a beautiful story and just lent itself to a gorgeous retelling. And I think Mulan, perhaps even more so. I'm so looking forward to just the visual musical just i I'm, I'm so excited for it i was really really happy with how they casted the movie um so i think other than infinity war live action mulan is is at the top of my list so just very quickly you know a show of of verbal hands you i take it that you like the live action remakes of the classic animated films as a whole yeah i mean i think they're they're really interesting i i i personally loved cinderella more than Beauty and the Beast. I think I was kind of in the minority there. Um, the message of the movie was gorgeous and just the, the visuals were beautiful. And 
sometimes I think the older movies are more interesting because there was less of a literal storyline that was being told. So I think with Cinderella, they had a lot more sort of artistic license to develop a simpler story that was once told with Beauty and the Beast. I think they were more wedded to a script and a storyline. Um, but no, I mean, I, I do enjoy them. I don't, I, I certainly don't think there are any, um, I don't think they take anything away from, from the classics. Um, I don't plan to see Dumbo because I was going to say, is something like Dumbo is, you know, Tim Burton and Dumbo, does that scare you at all? (laughs) Yeah. It's, I mean, I, my, my older son went through a Dumbo phase when he was like three years old where he wanted to watch it every day. And it was like horrible. (laughs) horrible. (laughs) So no, I don't, I don't intend to see Dumbo, but, but, um, but no, I mean, I, I think I, I, I love what they're doing with some of the live action retellings and, um, yeah, I, I enjoy them. And I mean, I think they, they stand on their own. I you see somebody like a John Favreau doing like Lion King gets you excited. Um, I wasn't as thrilled with the casting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the live actions are great ways to re kind of tell the story, but I, I personally, as an artist, as myself, the animated is always where it's going to be. I mean, that's where my heart lies and, you know, all the all the things that they do now with computer uh, animation and, and the technology and, and things like that. That's that to me is what I get more excited about. I I, old, I saw most of the live action. I appreciate them. I think they were really nicely done. Um, but it's still there's still that that animated quality that I do love to see. And I'm a really big fan of newer source material. I'm kind of tired of Alice in Wonderlands and Cinderella's and Peter Pan's. And all of the various, I mean, Christmas Carol, I'm just tired. There's like five of them that I just, can we please find something new, a new, any new story? It doesn't matter what it is. But I like it when they add depth to the original storyline. Like, you know, Beauty and the Beast didn't do that so much because again, I think like we were all old enough when that original movie came out that you couldn't just come in and sweep it out. But Cinderella, the the, the prince and the the storyline itself and the moral that's tied to it was so much better developed in the live action version than, and, and I'm a huge fan of the, the original um, and uh, Maleficent. I mean, it, you're just, you're adding depth to, I think these, these old stories that, that adds a lot of interest that might not otherwise have been there. I think Maleficent's a good example of that. So, um, so I, I mean, I enjoy them, you know, for, for what they are in themselves. I didn't expect to like Maleficent. And I did. Yeah, me either. It was it was it. a pleasant yeah. surprise. Me too. But let me just, and this is for the entire peanut gallery, rogues gallery, all of you. Um, <laughs> when I say that they are going to um, do a version of Aladdin and Will Smith is going to take on the role of Genie, first thoughts, Jimmy, go. What's When I say that, what's the first thing that you think? I, I, was, I didn't like the casting, not because it's Will Smith. But just because I, I had trepidation before all the live action started, I didn't think they were going to be able to do a good job with them just because you're taking classic animated films and you're just trying to retell them in real life situation, not real life, but like, you know, live action. For me, they surprised me with that. But with Aladdin, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you tell that story with some of the casting that they've done? Now they might surprise me, but for for me, and then, you look at the track that Will Smith's been on lately. I thought you would have found somebody else that who, who's had a little bit more success lately. And that's my only trepidation is that maybe he's not coming in as it is best for this. And he's getting a prequel. You know, the the, the genie is going to get his own prequel movie called Genies. And it's going to be the story that we necessarily don't know from the, the Disney version about how the genie uh, got into the lamp. I think it's See, important to remember how funny Will Smith is. He did all those blow him up movies, but like think back to his Fresh Prince days. The boy is funny. And if oh he- no no I get yeah I love the Fresh Prince days. I, I love those. I just I, some of the stuff that he's done lately it just hasn't impressed me all that much. So I'm I, it almost puts fear in me about like how is he going to do well in this role now? Are, again, are you talking about things tried. like Bright on Netflix? Have you seen Bright on Netflix? Very, I couldn't it, get through it. Yeah, yeah I couldn't get through it. I watched like ten minutes of it. And I had to turn that's it off. not. It's not Will Smith's fault, but it, it's a very no, no. It's an interesting. It's an interesting. Um, yeah, it's it, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's an interesting concept. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. And well, if you're not familiar with the stage version of Aladdin, you should look into that because I think that gives me hope that the live action movie is going to be really incredible. 
They did some amazing things when they translated that first stage. And the character of the genie in particular is one. And Robin Williams passed away during the run of Aladdin. And, you know, they gave him a special nod and everything. But they really revamped that to be less about the the animated character that we all know and love and sort of leave that preserved the way it is. And they took him a different direction. And it's really, really fabulous. And I think the live action movie, I'm hoping, will sort of go along that route. I, I, I actually just, was going to say the same thing. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Yeah. I, I was going to say the same That's thing. If, if Will Smith is a great actor, but if, if there had to be a replacement for the genie, it's the guy who was on Broadway. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal genie. I actually just read that he's leaving the show in February. He's gone. Did he, oh, was, he, did he James Monroe eigelhart has been gone a while. He's been in Hamilton. Oh, okay. I saw it last year or whatever. Either way, but they... That 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 guy was the closest to Robin Williams' energy that I was able to to see, and uh, you know that was if there had to be a replacement, I would have said it would have had to be him. You know, I was I was just gonna say I think you know it, it it's a good point overall. I think the cat the casting of it, the genie was Robin Williams, you know, for for all of us growing up. Um, so I don't know who they could have cast. <laughs> You know, in, in the live action role that would have satisfied any of us. I mean, he he is Robin Williams. It's just they're, they're one in the same. Um, and I, I think it, it might be a good point. Like when I'm looking back at the movies, the live actions that I've liked and that I haven't liked. I mean, seeing Hermione play Belle was difficult. Um, seeing Beyonce in The Lion King is is going to be difficult. There weren't any names like that in Cinderella. It was just sort of told in itself, and there it, it wasn't really like pandering to a younger generation as much with with its casting. Um, so that might have been a part of why I liked Cinderella so much, but but it, but it is a challenge to cast these roles. You know, the, the genie is the perfect example where you know the the person who voiced it originally was it is so the face of the character. Um, yeah. but I, I, I have I have I think Will Smith is he'll be fun. I think he'll be fun. Right, and I think he's going to appeal to to you know again a, a younger generation who he's uh, and I, I don't mean the fresh prince generation i mean just a younger generation that knows him um i thought the casting of beyonce in lion king was like the casting of beyonce and gold member um but <laughs> we'll see what um what it, it actually plays out so i didn't mean to interrupt you sorry no no i was okay. that was it okay. um two other films just to specifically pull out um that i'm excited for and curious about uh wreck it ralph 2 ralph breaks the internet comes out on november 21st um wreck it ralph was one of those films that i absolutely loved because i was a, a complete video game nerd it was a completely new ip so it wasn't sort of a retelling of a tale that we had known before i thought that the voice casting in that was phenomenal and i and i loved those characters i, I loved that story and i'm curious to see where it's going to go when that comes out in uh, November. More importantly, I think with the success of Wreck-It Ralph, what I think they are able to do because of the world in which it is told, um, I would not be surprised if Wreck-It Ralph's presence in the Disney world, it, like Ralph himself, um, comes off the screen and into a... Um, Look, like what Walt Disney with the films in, in Disneyland, I think is going to happen to Wreck-It Ralph. I think Wreck-It Ralph is going to have a presence in the Disney parks sooner rather than later, um, and possibly even this year. I wouldn't be surprised if, if we just saw him this year. Sorry? He was at the marathon. They had a character stop. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I'm going to just, I, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so I'm kind of hoping as well, just to I, I'm moving on probably a little bit, but that, that thing about movies that do well, bringing things over into the park, that sort of makes me excited for Mary Poppins. That's exactly where I was going. I was going to say, I'm going to give you three words. You guys just take the ball and run with it. Mary Poppins returns on Christmas Day. Thoughts? United Kingdom Pavilion. <laughs> I mean, look there have been there were plans for a mary poppins themed attraction before walt disney world even opened um there was going to be and i think we, we talked about this a, a long long time ago in uh in in a show that we did 
about unrealized attractions or the Walt Disney World that never was or what. I mean, it was supposed to be a Mary Poppins attraction in Fantasyland. There was also going to be a um, an entire like Cherry Tree Lane area in the UK Pavilion in some of the early concepts as well. But does the idea of Mary Poppins returning and it not being Dame Julie Andrews um, does it excite you? Does it cause you a little bit of fear and or trepidation? I think it's exciting. I think when you have something that's been played by such an iconic person, you you, you can't you have to to move away from that and 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 do your casting in a completely different way. And I think they haven't tried to replace Julie Andrews. I don't think they've they've kind of said let's let's move on from that. Because you can't replace Julie Andrews. Of you know, course you can't. And why would you want to? Right. But, you know, I think the the conversation over the last few minutes, too, is kind of circled around like with Star Wars. We could just choose to omit the one, two, and three from our canon. And, and you know, if you really are a fan of G- Julie Andrews and want to watch the original Mary Poppins and not your Mary Poppins, then so be it. You know, I think, you know, if you're going to recreate it and you have to go with new and you have to, you know, try something different, but you don't have to, it, it's not being forced on you. So... I think you were, you know, I'm open to it. The original will always be our Mary Poppins. Right, right. I think it's... See, and I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I 100% agree with y'all. I mean, because it goes back to what Lisa was saying about Robin Williams being Aladdin, the genie. I, I think you think of Mary Poppins, you think of Julie Andrews. And that that's what scares me. Yeah, and... Yeah, but, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, but you also think of Mary Poppins not as the character, but as the groundbreaking kind of movie that it was with, you know, mixing live action and animation and, you know, like uh, all of the, the us older diehards who, you know, who who see the, the original, who respect the original Disney Studios animation. You know, the story was great, the characters are great, but it was also a, an interesting time for that movie to exist. So, you know, I think we can let that stand on its own. So you know what I think is fascinating? Not one of you mentioned Solo, the Star Wars movie. <clears throat> <laughs> Let, let's wait and see how that one comes out. So, and so Keith, I, I think it, it, to me, um, and the fact that you, you know, cleared your throat and said, let's wait and see. If you would have said that, in 1978, that a new Star Wars movie was coming out, people would have started lining up in 1979 for the 1980 release. Now, you know, I think because of what has sometimes been either a lukewarm or somewhat divisive um, response to things like The Last Jedi, there is no longer, and correct me if I'm wrong, other than for sort of the hardcore diehard Star Wars fans, there is not there's no longer that knee jerk OMG reaction when we hear that a new Star Wars film is coming out. If I would have heard that that a new Star Wars film was coming out in just a few months back in 1987, 1990, 1995, I would have been as excited as I was bef- when they announced and when they released the Star Wars episode 1. Now all of a sudden I think it is a little bit more of a wait and see because I think things like Last Jedi um, put the Star Wars fan universe into two ish different camps. Well, I I think you know I think we're the older Star Wars uh, fanboys, and we have our our things that we love. But it's clearly there's a it's a new day. It's a new you know new new um, generation of Star Wars fans that like different things and whatnot. But again, you know, I think there's so much saturation in the brand between, you know, they had the television shows, the animated, you know, all that stuff like that. We can choose not to exist. And I, when they first told me Solo was coming out, I was all in it. Great character. And I've had actually conversations on message boards with some friends of mine and stuff where he's such a great, you know, Harrison Ford was such a great character. You know, how could you do this to him and whatnot? But that, that character still exists as Harrison Ford. I can watch the older older movies. I can appreciate his role. I can do that stuff. But if Solo's fantastic, which I hope it is, I will embrace it and move on. If it's not, it's literally just it's it's a pinky on the hand of the 
uh, of the universe. And you know, it's interesting with with Marvel though, where they're with the with the um, the new movie you guys are coming out with, where you're introducing now there's characters are starting to cross into each other, like you said, Lisa, where the Guardians of the Galaxy are coming in and they're they're all interacting. Right now, we don't have that. You know what I mean? Like we're gonna Star Wars can have these back of a little better word universes and let them live and if solo is a flop well solo is a flop and that, that it's it's it dies on the vine um i i don't I'm, I'm hopeful the news from it is scary from a studio perspective i mean there's not a lot of great signs that are out there that it's gonna be great but surprise me let me let me see what it is and uh and like i said harrison ford the genie, they'll all be the originals. I can, I can rest and, and appreciate those performances. And the original Star Wars movies were also three years apart and sort of defining your childhood with their mm-hmm. huge releases. I mean, we're all still sort of trying to process The Last Jedi and six months later, Solo's coming out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's... it's the, like Look, you said, there's, I, I want there's Solo to do well. Completely. I want Solo oh, to do well just so I can take up my Lando Calrissian costume again and be relevant <laughs> when I, you know. You can always take the- out that costume. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I was uh, going to be agreeing with Elisa completely because the first thing I thought of was you've had some sort of Star Wars film for the last, uh, for the last three years. One come out every year and, it's, uh, and you're going to have that for the next few years. At what point do you, like Keith was saying, where, what point do you oversaturate it and you get people not looking forward to it anymore? Because, yeah, it's not seven, eight, and nine, but you have these other films in between, but it's still Star Wars films. So that's my fear is that you're just putting out too much and people aren't, like you were saying, Luke, get excited and line up a year in advance for tickets. I just think it's too much wait a year or wait two years. Because, like you were saying, Lisa, all of a sudden we're still. I still haven't seen Last Jedi, so I'm going to see Last Jedi in the next week or two, and then, what, five, six months later, I'm going to see Solo, so it's kind of like, uh, that's a bit much for me. Again, it's interesting, um, you're right, in terms of the balance of striking while the, the Star Wars iron is hot versus do we spread things out so much so to create um, that that hunger for it. Um, that's just not the way it works now. When something is hot, w- they go all in and there's sequels and there's attractions and, you know, um, I, I don't know why for some reason the uh, Emma Watson Bell doll came into he- <laughs> to my mind <laughs> in terms of merchandising <laughs> that they release. Um, but, um, all right, so sort of coming Justin off... Justin Bieber one. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, coming off the the films, um, there's a few things that are happening, I think, on, on the, the small screen. Um, at least car- for the time being, I think this is going to change in the next few years. Um, uh, the unique content that is being developed for the Marvel characters on Netflix is going to continue with things like uh, Daredevil and Luke Cage. That might change with the introduction of Disney's streaming service in the next few years. Um, Going around the horn again in the same order, is there anything else on your list that you are looking forward to or excited about in 2018? Or Keith, go ahead. Oh, well, I, going back to the large screen for a second, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's confirmed or not, I wanted to ask you, is there a Dark Crystal re-release and a Netflix series oh. coming out? I mean, it's not Disney, but Hanson. Um, I've heard through the rumor mill that there's going to be a re-release in February of the Dark Crystal and then a Netflix series later on in the year. So just going back to that, that old childhood freak you out kind of movies. So the only thing I saw was that the Dark Crystal was coming back to theaters only for two nights in February. Is that it, as opposed to yeah, it might be it a, a long term? But then there's a, I think there's a Netflix series. It's a, called a the prequel. Dark Crystal, uh, yeah, Re- yeah, prequel Age series something. So and, and again, I think Child of the Eighties rejoices. Yeah, that's right. So you know, Dark Crystal, Dark Crystal well, we was the last Jedi of the eighties because well, we it need black hole and we're in good shape. <laughs> oh, and Fraggle Rock, we need Fraggle Rock. Okay. In the dark. If if they, they, yes, Lisa. If yes, they would redo Rock, the Black Hole. It. No, redo Black Hole first, and that's <laughs> that's a remake that I'm totally down with. Um, yes. I, I oh, listen. I, I knew a guy who bought one of the Vincent robots, and he was looking oh, to sell them. And I would, yeah. Um, unfortunately, hi, I'm a podcaster. I really wanted the Vincent robot and I would have hung him right there in the corner of my office, but 
I need to do a Kickstarter campaign so I can uh, so I can buy Vincent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, Dark Crystal was again too one of those ones that when it was released had it, you know mixed reactions. But again, there was a, a very uh, hardcore fan base that that loved and clearly still loves um, Dark Crystal. So, uh, all right. So, Ali, anything? Um, uh, and I'll feel it, just so you know, Ali. When we were talking about Star Wars, that's a a, a space opera from the 1970s. I'll I'll fill you in on some of the, the details. One with the bears. I saw the one with the bears. I told you. <laughs> the one with the bear. I have that costume too. Um, uh, no. Things I can live the rest of my life without seeing. <laughs> uh, Listen, don't knock it till you try. Anyway, moving on. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? Um, so, go ahead. I'm really. I, I don't know if I'm going to make enemies on this, but I'm really actually looking forward to the new show that's replacing Flights of Wonder. Because I'm not one to say, let's not bring IP into the parks, right? Because I think as a parent, when I'm vacationing there with my kids, which I occasionally do, most of the time I leave them at home. But when I occasionally bring them with, (laughs) what they want to do is what we do. So if I can make a show about birds relevant to them by including Doug and Russell, then I get to see the show about birds that I'm interested in and they get to see the characters that they're interested in. If I can make Epcot more relevant to them by including Ratatouille or um, what's the Marvel one? The Guardians, the Guardians. Energy of the Energy. Galaxy. Guardians of the, the Galaxy. Yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, it was Marvel, that's the thing. Um, if I can make those things more relevant to them so that we can enjoy them together as a family, then I'm all about that. And I don't think it's a bad thing. And I think shows in general like that, I mean, I like Flights of Wonder, but it's time to change it. It's And and if you bring a character or an IP in, so be it. I mean, but those are those instances kind of going back to the call back to the beginning of the show where you can make quick change, refreshing, not expensive um, updates to the park that bring us new new experiences. Um, And that's fine. Guano Joe's great, but he had his run and, uh, you know, Take your uh, tourist flag and find another uh, group to go find. Uh, Ali, I- I'm with you as well. Um, I-, I certainly would like to hear from the rest of you. I-, I have no problem bringing IP into the parks because I think you're right. They're guest satisfiers. It's what guests want to see. Nobody, save for maybe a co- nobody is lining up at 8 a.m., at uh, the, the the gates of Disney's Animal Kingdom and making a beeline for Flights of Wonder. That is going to potentially change a little bit when Doug and Russell are in there and when adults and or their kids are like, hey, I, I know these characters. I love that film. I want to see it. It does. It adds a sense of relevance. And again, not to sort of, you know, scratch at, at you know, or to poke the bear, uh, you know, like it or not, that's what Frozen did at Epcot. Frozen it was the beginning of a, a rebirth in Epcot, specifically not just the Norway Way Pavilion, but bringing more guests and children into World Showcase. Like it, don't like it. it it's the the lines still are what they are, and that is the the barometer and the indicator that Disney has to use. Well, I think World Showcase is is a unique animal where you know the pavilions as a whole were are are a lot of eye candy for adults and people who want to travel and don't, what have you. But I'm not a, I, 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 I have no problem with IPs in World Showcase. I think that they've been there undercover between the, you know, the meet and greets and what have you. But I, I am still the kind of person that still loves an original idea. And I would love to see, you know, some of those come back. I mean, you know, going back to, to, um, to Animal Kingdom, I mean, if the Safari numbers are down, would you be in favor of Pumbaa and Timon animatronics being kind of put in there to kind of, you know, bolster that thing? And I don't think so, because, you know, it's not the right place for it. Epcot Future World, well, yes, Marvel's going to come in there. That's fantastic. Uh, we, we, you listen, I love a good coaster, so I don't care who's on it. But I still think those, you know, test track kind of, you know, world of motion, those still, there are original ideas out there that don't have to have an IP. But if you have some, you have a 60-40 split, I, I'm fine with it. It's just that I'd still love I, – I, I think that the pendulum is swung in the safer area where the IPs kind of have to be there. And that's really where it scares me a little bit, you know. Well, and again, I'm, I'm not – you know, saying one way or the other, I'm playing devil's advocate for, for purposes of discussion. Look, when you are trying to attract 
a, a guest, and by guest I mean the family of, of husband, wife, two and a half kids, when you're trying to attract that family that on average visits Walt Disney World once every five to six slash seven years, and you are trying to craft a marketing campaign to draw them there, are you going to do it with, hey, come and check out this new attraction about birds, or, hey, come and see a new Frozen attraction, which is going to perk your daughter's ears up? Do you say... A Guardians, and we're bringing Guardians of the Galaxy to Epcot, where all of a sudden, you know, everybody in the family gets excited. Um, we we can't um, we can't get too upset about it because you can almost make an argument that that's what was done from day one at Disneyland. I mean, Fantasyland was based on the IP that was popular in order to attract people in, and then they were also became familiar with the other attractions that were there too that weren't based on an IP, but this is creating experiences based on things that are familiar um, and certainly revenue generating is not something new. Well, I'm really interested in the way that they're handling studios now with uh, this kind of like, you know, expansion point five with the Mickey and Minnie, um, you know, the, the, the great movie ride redo because it's not a land it's its own attraction. It's kind of settled. The opening is going to be somewhere between Toy Story and 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 Star Wars. And it's kind of like it's a separate kind of thing that's happening. Is like we got Star Wars, we got Toy Story, and we're gonna have this other one too. And you know that might be interesting because from what I know, from what I remember, at least in my forefront, is that they've never really done that kind of like end one kind of attraction. They've opened lands, they've opened individual attractions. But there's never that like offshoot that says, you know, we have Frozen, come see Frozen, but we also did this one too. You know what I mean? Just to just to, to bring guests around and not I mean, look at look at Pandora. Five hour waits. I mean, you know, people were starving for a brand new experience that everybody was going to Pandora. And things I was reading is that one of the mistakes that they made is that they didn't have that side of side, you know, attraction that would get people to Pandora and somewhere else. So everybody was like a funnel just going there. So I think, again, listen, time, money, and expenses, but I think there's room for those other experiences that they don't have to highly, highly market. I think Pandora deserves its five-hour waits. And yeah, it, it is its own encompassed thing. You're supposed to get lost in it. And I think, Lou, like you were saying, I mean, I think the, the, the original idea of Disneyland was to sort of give you a three-dimensional interactive experience of the movies um, and, you know, to, you know, Snow White and Cinderella and, and to let you sort of be in those worlds that, that people had fallen in love with, you know, with, with the movies. So I don't have an issue with continuing that. And you know, that's what Disney is. Disney isn't Bush Gardens. Disney isn't Hershey Park. Disney isn't, you know, you're not going to just get on a roller coaster to ride a roller coaster when you're at Disney World. Disney is its IP. Um, so they're not just going to open a ride to open a ride. Um, you know, they're, the idea is to to have an immersive experience where you are sort of living in the world of the movies. Um, you know, do, do they need to be sort of careful about, you know, dropping things into world showcase? Yeah, probably. But at the same time, I mean, I think, you know, that you don't go to Disney world to ride a roller coaster. You go to Disney world to be immersed in the world of those movies. Um, and so I, I'll never have an issue with them doing that. I agree with you a thousand percent. And as you were saying that, and again, it's it's a it's a different animal. But I was thinking about how, having come from the Asian parks this past year, how somewhat different that is over there, where a place like Tokyo Disney Sea is firmly rooted in having very little that is based on current or even earlier IP, save for things like Nemo and you know, the, the Aladdin merry-go-round and a few things here and there, you know, there's entire lands that have no Disney IP in them at all. Journey into the center of the earth and all the Da Vinci stuff in there, you know, is not Disney. There's nothing Disney there. Even the things that you see in the American waterfront and in the Mediterranean area, you know, save for the under the sea, little mermaid area, there's not necessarily a lot of that. Um, And again, it, it might be, uh, some cultural differences there in terms of what our attractors look. We saw that 
even Main Street USA and, and some of the parks are different because they're just not familiar with so mm-hmm. many of the characters and the IPs that w- that we are here in the States. Um, but it'll be interesting to see as time goes on, you know, if, if you are tasked with expanding or building in, in Epcot or in World Showcase um, and you have the choice of, you know, uh, something that's based on an IP or trying to come up with something that is unique, you know, what is a, a quote unquote safer bet for, for Disney? What is going to garner more discussion and attention? Is it something that nobody's ever heard of before or is it something based on something that we're familiar with? Um, you know, the, the Tron coaster, if, if it was just a new, futuristic roller coaster coming to Tomorrowland, would there be as, as much excitement as because it's Tron? Again, that's 1982 Lou Mangello speaking. <laughs> um, so um, anybody else? I, I know we were sort of going in order and I forgot who was next, but anything I, else? I, 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 I have a couple. Um, uh, so for me, te- technology is a big thing. Um, so the, there's a couple of, of bits that I think Certainly some are happening next year. Some might be further in the future. Uh, the first one is Bluetooth Magic Bands. Just what they are going to be able to do when, when that hits, it, it just blows my mind completely. Um, all, all they've really talked about so far is is walking up to your hotel room and, and, and going straight through the door without having to you know, tap anything, which is great. But that gives them so much more scope for understanding people and, and getting new new experiences to you. Um, through the magic band so that's a big one uh, and the other one being transport so self-driving vehicles which i'm i'm sure is is forefront of their mind at the moment that's uh, the people at disney you um you you touched on a couple of things that I, i'm going to save for the end as i talk about a couple of my predictions but they're very much in alignment with what you were saying uh in terms of how technology and i think beginning this year is going to markedly change the 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 guest experience um and technology is going to technology itself is going to be a big guest satisfier so I, i'm with you a hundred percent um absolutely yeah. because the, 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 the bluetooth the one, and the magic bands is it, opening your door is is the very scratching the surface of what that's going to be able to do I the really, one that, that, sorry, okay. No, I was, uh, really, Magic Bands, I think, is going to be a great, great uh, advancement coming up with, you know, I mean, hopefully they, they do things with geolocating and, and, you know, things like that where, you know, you're walking past a, a store and it's, 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 you know, they, they entice you and they bring you into different places and help move guest flow around. And I think that, uh, you know, all of that information is going to be really important in the next year or so. Already now, when you walk by a restaurant that has the mobile ordering option, my my Apple Watch will you know mm-hmm. via via the app buzz and you know let me know that I have that option. So yeah, it's it's cool to kind of see it develop live. Definitely, the the, the things they can do with with guest flow, I just think are, are going to be remarkable. Even to the point of you know this area is too busy. Let's say mm-hmm. hey, here's ten percent right. off <laughs> off a. Uh, <laughs> A, well, that'll a, never happen. You ain't getting well, discounted. Well, no, it, it does happen. It, it does no, happen, I, and I agree with you. In, look, one thing that that I think we as guests don't think about is, and and I mean this in in a non invasive kind of way. This is not a, a conversation about privacy, but the data that Disney is able to collect via the Magic Bands in terms of where you're going, guest uh-huh. flow, what your interests are what you're spending money on, what you're doing and what you're not doing. Again, it's not you specifically, Keith, what you are, but it's what you as a guest or what you and your family does. And you are going, look, you already see that. You already see leaving some restaurants, hey, take this receipt, use it today, and you can save 10% on merchandise. You are going to get those flash offers to, hey, if you go to, you know, uh, wherever I'm trying to think of an attraction. I, for some reason, I can't think of an attraction in Walt Disney World. <laughs> if you go over to 
you know, Peter Pan's flight right now, there's only a 10 minute wait. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely going to do that. And I'll talk more because I think the most, let me not overstate that. One of the most important parts of your Disney vacation going forward, and this could be a separate conversation for a separate day, is going to be your phone. Mm -hmm. It is going to be your phone, not just in terms of the information that it provides you. And I'll, 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 I'll elaborate more as we go on, but the data that they are collecting is not only going to benefit Disney, but is absolutely going to benefit you as a guest. Yep. So I agree. Uh, Chris, anything else on your list? Yeah, there, there was just one more, just because it's uh, a kind of first for, for Disney ever. Uh, and that's a, a, a new castle in, in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, let's say the guests aren't, aren't happy with what we have. <laughs> hey, let's build a new one. I like how you call Hong Kong we. Um, (laughs) But you're right. It's not – I think it – it's very similar to obviously Sleeping Beauty Castle in Disneyland, which obviously was was the original. Um, When you see that castle and then having been to or you go to or you watch on TV Shanghai or Tokyo, you're like, meh, we got robbed. Mm -hmm. So I I agree. And because of – the way that you enter that park and what you see behind it, you know, with the mount, with something we're not used to seeing with these mountains behind it, the, um, I, I think our, our sort of reverse force perspective makes that castle look smaller than it really is. Which is a shame because it's beautiful. It's a wonderful castle, but it gets lost. It does get lost there. So, Keith, anything else on your list? Uh, I mean, it, you know, going back to uh, not to elaborate, but the, the IPs. I mean, Disneyland doubling down on Pixar, you know, and DCA and what have you. I mean, they've gotten full full blown Pixar over there, so that's going to be interesting to see how that comes. Um, and then, lastly, just a wish. I mean, is there any way we get a nighttime parade at Magic Kingdom? Please, <laughs> I, I can't. I I don't even know it. It's I don't know that place without a parade, and it's been a couple of years now, and that's really like. You know, that would be my hope if I had a, if I had a hope for uh, 18, that we'd get some kind of an answer for that. Listen, dreams really do yep. come true. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll there's, leave with there's that. There's a method to the madness. There's a method to the madness. Uh, Jimmy, anything else? The only thing for me is what's going to replace Illuminations. I, I'm interested to see. Yeah. I, I don't want it to go away. Trust me, I don't. But I understand that it will. I know. I know what it is. <laughs> but I want to see what they replace it with, and see what they do with that, and see if it's still in the same aspect that they're doing now, or if it's something completely different. My hope for what is to um, I, replace illumination. I mean, you can't replace illumination, but what is going to uh, be there in its stead? Again, and I only say this for point of reference, having seen what they can do in the foreign parks, specifically in Tokyo, where they have a similar giant lagoon that you can experience from 360 degrees, I think the opportunity to bring something truly spectacular to World Showcase um, is there. I think it is one that is going to come. I think the timing, again, is going to be very deliberate to coincide with um, some other things that are coming to that park. So uh, patience will be a virtue, but I've seen what they can do during the day. I've seen what they can do at night there, and that gets me excited for what I think is going to come to World Showcase in alignment with some of the other things that are developing at that park. Was that I mean, vague? having that having emotion, <laughs> having having emotionally watched, you know, I, I talked about it on the you know, the look back for 2017, the the, the final show of wishes, um, and then you know, grudgingly going into happily ever after, um, <laughs> it, and it, it's it's wonderful. So I mean, and I'm I'm that much more emotionally tied to Illumination, so I'm hoping it's it's similar. But you know, I haven't been to the the, the Asian parks. Um, I know you left there, you know, talking about you know, high hopes for what would replace illuminations, but even seeing the, the phantasmic that when we did the soft opening of that at D 23, um, I'm not a huge phantasmic, you know, watcher. Um, it's, it's not high on my list, 
here, but then seeing what they did with that in Disneyland, um, you know, it was, was stunning. So I can only imagine what they could do with a 360 degree lagoon at Upcut. Purely hypothetically speaking, don't read my <laughs> facial expressions. If Fantasmic was to go away, what would be your reaction? I, you can say it out loud, Allie. You don't have to cl- clap quietly. I'm, I'm all for it as long yeah. as it's not Star Wars that replaces it. Because <laughs> I don't <laughs> care about Star Wars. I don't know anything about Star but Wars. But if, if they just said Fantasmic is closing on X day and it's going to be replaced with an as yet unannounced show, which will bring in Disney characters in, in a similar kind of way. Two very enthusiastic thumbs up. Fine yeah. holiday fun. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me, me, too. Yeah. me too. Me too. Especially if they're especially if they're replacing it with what they're doing in Disneyland. It's and I, I like Fantasmic. I love the music. I think it's got some, you know, great effects and, and, and everything like that. But like 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 Lisa was saying, you know, I think their entertainment, the fireworks, the shows, aside from maybe what happened in Animal Kingdom, has been really spot on as they change. And I think we trust in that. You know what I mean? I think that they, they have some phenomenal um entertainment uh, creators and, and and whatnot that that between the projection mapping and the technologies i mean listen i love fantastic but the dragon is a, a couple sheets hanging off of a uh you know a, a, on a stick so you know. <laughs> that whole Pocahontas scene i'm just like okay we get it like they said, <laughs> let's move on right. and it's we'll a great it. space and it's a fantastic theater to watch a show so <laughs> You know, uh, again, unlike Animal Kingdom, where they really kind of had to shoehorn a theater into a, a smaller space and it caused some flow issues and whatnot. It's a fantastic place for a show. I would love I, I'd welcome a new show there. Everything that you guys just said about Fantasmic, right? Uh, you've seen it. It was great. Put away something new. It's a great theater. Take all those things and replace Fantasmic with Cirque du Soleil, because that's exactly what I think is going to happen to that theater in 2018. Uh, as somebody who loves and appreciates live performances, I dig Cirque du Soleil shows, except that one that I saw in Las Vegas, which was really, really weird, and it was uncomfortable because I was with my dad. But um, <laughs> other than that one, I love the Cirque du Soleil shows. We don't know when it's going to open, but I am excited, and, it, and fan, the, the Fantasmic conversation made me think of this specifically. I'm excited for the change that is going to come to that theater. I think that is going to be a huge hit and something that's going to help to usher in a, a, um, a an ongoing upgrade because that's what I'm going to call it. It's an upgrade to that particular section of Disney Springs. And talk about a place for IP. No kidding. <laughs> Oh, I, did, no I do like the Vegas Cirque, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of them. <laughs> we'll talk about this off loud. There, listen, <laughs> there's a lot of, listen, I thought O and Mystere and Ka were phenomenal. That's not the one I'm talking about. That's not the one I'm talking about either. I was with my dad. We were right up in front. I was really awkward. <laughs> not the show coming to Cirque du Soleil in Disney Springs. It's, it's two very, I'm probably blushing, two very opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, Allie, anything else on your list? Actually, when he talked about Pixar Pier, he completely finished my list. So I'm good. Sorry about that. No, that's great. I was I was really excited that we touched on them all. And I didn't say, you know, but a third of them, so that's awesome. Yeah, I'm I mean, excited. look, I, I'm excited yeah. for Rose Gold Cupcakes is... Rick Springfield. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing that links to that is is Paint the Night coming back to uh, to DCA. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never seen that show, so I'm hoping to get to to see that this year. Yeah, there's um. Again, I think there's a lot that's happening over at California, um, specifically in in California Adventure. Um, so I'm going to go need to take a research trip again uh, sometime this year. Uh, Lisa, anything else on your list? No, Keith actually finished my list with the nighttime parade hopes. Two, um, two. Look at that. So, so <laughs> I love and appreciate all of you, but I, I'm I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed in, in all of you. Thank I, you. I, I, oh, I, Disney Springs, Disney Springs geez. restaurants. Disney Springs <laughs> isn't getting not one, not two, not three, four, five. They're getting eight 
new dining locations in 2018. And I, have well, I would we thought that you were saving the best. I'm like, come on, somebody. Yeah, no. Bring it yeah, home for the, me, mama. Like, the tie-in. The tie-in. I had it on I my finished, list. Oh, I finished listen. everybody's list. <laughs> Lou finishes everybody's plate. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I hated that new I, pizza place. Yeah, I have a when I was there. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. So very quickly, um, the the (laughs) eight new venues that are coming or have recently opened in Disney Springs include the Edison, which uh, I I was live from there last week. You can see it looks like a a nineteen twenties electric company power plant not like the electric company my childhood show from the nineteen seventies, but a real electric company power plant. I'm curious to see um, as this continues to go and grow what exactly I haven't eaten there yet. I haven't been there in the evenings yet. Uh, I'm curious to see what the crowds are going to be like there, especially late night on weekends. Uh, Terralina crafted Italian is coming in. I think just a a few months Um, that's coming. That's going to replace where, Portobello was. Look, I'm always down for a new Italian restaurant. Um, some of the new offerings that we've seen, like Maria and Enzo's, which also just opened, seem to be getting it right. Um, that's located next to the Edison. It's owned by the Patina Group that also does Morimoto and Via Napoli. If you watch the live broadcast from the preview and the grand opening that you did, um, I, I think it speaks for itself because when I eat 17 rice balls and still leave, you you know that um, I love it. Enzo's Hideaway is, I think, going to be one of the cool, hip, especially for local night spots. Um, it is built in the it's located in the old tunnels that actually Disney Spring downtown Disney Pleasure Island used to use and it's inspired by these small like Roman appetizer bars so the menu not just cocktail but the dining menu there is more Roman food as opposed to Maria, Maria and Enzo's which is um go, going to be more or, or is more um uh, northern and central Italian wine bar. George is going to open in just a few months. Uh, George Miliotis is going to come back to Disney. He helped open California Grill back in 1995, which it, with a uh, a very intimate and and I think the concept is really going to be a warm and welcoming sort of wine bar, like from an old country type of estate. Uh, Pizza Ponte just opened next to. Maria and Enzo's. I've had a chance. I, I walked through it as it first opened. Uh, I haven't eaten there as yet, but it's going to. It is sort of a fast casual restaurant with individual slices of pizza, as well as a lot of traditional Italian desserts. Uh, if I start to name them, it's going to sound like I'm reading off the menu when I was going to my grandmother's house every Sunday in, in Brooklyn. Um, Jaleo opens in mid 2018 they are actually building that location now that is a spanish concept from chef jose andre and wolfgang puck's bar and grill uh sort of that relaxed california dining is going to go over where um the coke um the world of coke building currently is in that section of disney Springs. so there's a lot to be excited about and a lot to be hungry for in disney springs out of any of those which is the one that is currently just sort of reading off the names most attractive to you i have a question first lou and i wonder if you've run the numbers on this do we now have more restaurants and attractions in walt disney world i hope so um, you know I mean, what I mean? I, like, if you think about it, that's a long <laughs> list of restaurants that are brand new, and you think about it, that's a there's a lot of places to eat. And you're saying that restaurants aren't attractions? That was gonna say. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just we just bonded, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say they weren't. I'm just saying. But you all, need I mean, it. You know, you obviously need it. Um, and again, in terms of not just having destinations to go to, but types of cuisine to um to attract people to look I, i've said it before and i say it half jokingly and lisa you as a local probably can agree or, or not to this you know disney springs is sort of like a fifth gate because of the amount of time that you can go and spend there with family with friends just wandering around you go to the movies 
you go have something to eat, and then you go have, have something to eat again. I find that I spend more time there than I do um, probably in the parks, and that's not – I mean, most of it's spent at the boathouse, I know, but even notwithstanding that, um, it, it's easy to go to, it's easy to wander around to, and it's um, – I think, especially as a local – it's accomplished this this idea of being just a friendly, open, welcoming place that you can just go to hang out um, without having to go and and you know into uh, into a theme park. And it's easy. I mean, as, as a local, like to when you go to a to a park, and you don't need the word probably. You go to Disney Springs more than you go to the park. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but no, but I think I do too. And it's it's I, I love how low hassle it is. I mean, parking is easy. The you know the garages are well placed. It's it's a super low hassle place to go. Everything is really well. Spread Orange out. garage, baby. Orange garage yeah. for days. And I think um, I think it. You know, when we were down there for Momentum plug, um, we were down there for Momentum. <laughs> it was a. You know, the one thing I said to everybody was like, you know, finally adults. I mean, I've been going down with kids now for a long time, but I really, there was a time when my wife and I would visit just as adults. And now there's a place that's quintessential after hours, adults, you can kind of get away from it, but you're still in the bubble. And I had a client who was going down to the Orlando area for a conference and she's like, Keith, where am I going? I said, Disney Springs, just go. Like, don't even, there was no, no thought or hesitation just, and, and she came back and loved every minute of it. So, you know, it, it has added that that layer of now adults that they ever had needed a reason to go, but it gives them that extra reason, you know, to not not have to worry about, you know, well, it's a kid's place. And I think the variety is just amazing. Like you were speaking to Lou, as far as like the variety of food. I mean, whatever you want to choose, you have options there, you know, from casual to really, really fine dining. And that's what I love is that you have anything and everything that you want right there and you, it's all within walking distance and exactly. you have entertainment in between all the different venues that you're going Are you to. talking about the boathouse well, or Disney Springs altogether? Because all those things actually apply to boathouse as well. You well, can the do boat casual, house, of course. you can do fancy, you know, there's entertainment, hey. it, it's a very easy walk. So, well, And yeah, the quality is there. I mean, whether you're eating a poutine yeah. at a food stand or, I mean, I'm not familiar with the boathouse, but the restaurants that I've been to. <laughs> it's lovely, Lisa. It's lovely. <laughs> is it good? It's very good. good. Those nails, Lisa, they dig deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I made reservations but... at the boathouse for my birthday this year. So I'm super... Did you? Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Plus yeah. one for Lisa. <laughs> hey, I got reservations next Wednesday. Come on down. Come join me. Hear that, Lou? Um, no, no, but seriously, like whether you're eating poutine at a, you know, a walk-up stand or you're at a, you know, a seated, you know, more you know, signature line restaurant. I mean, the, the quality is always there and you're not squeezed in, you know, if you're, you know, sitting, you know, on the deck somewhere in the open air eating or it, it it's a Disney-esque experience, um, you know, the, the service to the the surroundings, you know, th- throughout Disney Springs. And I've, and I've, I've said before, but I'm, I'm really impressed with, um, you know, how they've, they've managed to carry that into Springs and be consistent. And to your point, and, and I don't know if it was you or, or- uh, or Chris said to Keith about having more restaurants. You do, but it it eliminates or is eliminated a a a a pain point for guests, which was I can't get reservations anywhere. I can't eat nope. anywhere. All I'm having is chicken right. nuggets. Now all of a sudden, you have not just a few options inside the park. You've got incredible options throughout the resort. And I think again, you know, I sort of say about you know spreading out the herd, but. There are now culinary attractors, not in the parks, but in places like Disney Springs, as well as the resorts. Well, it's funny because I was just about to mention that, you know, the, the, the beauty of all these new restaurants and private restaurants that are showing up in Disney Springs is kind of one of the things when I kind of help people plan some visits or, you know, people who aren't, aren't as savvy as, as a, a traveler and they can't get those reservations because they didn't know what they wanted 180 days away, that there's those selection of tables that you can get at Disney Springs that aren't in the Disney reservation bubble. And, you know, those are options for you that, you know, may have be closed out in other places. So that's kind of one of those great things about it is that nothing against Disney, but that, that, you know, the planning aspect where the adults don't want to have that long-term planning phase, they can go there and get those tables and enjoy the dinners without being that typical 180 day kind of uh, resort guest. 
And prior to being a local, I mean, I was that person who would go on, you know, 180 days out and book the hard to get mm-hmm. stuff. Right. You know, and, and and I enjoyed it to an extent. And I understand that. Like to me, it sort of it extended the trip experience to to be planning six months out and thinking about where we were going to eat and what we were going to ride and all that good stuff. But now as a local, I sort of, you know, I, I laugh at that in a way because it's it's so unnecessary. I mean, we'll I pop into the app, you know, an hour before we're going to go eat and can consistently always find right great restaurant it right. part of the fun now right yeah. right right and i think it takes away a lot of that disappointment that when you mm-hmm. don't get that reservation at that one place that you've got so many more options now right. so mm-hmm. it's, it's like lessening that blow that you can actually say oh okay well we can just go here it, you know like it's, it's okay so if better. you're not if you didn't get the br guest reservation. right there's right, I was right. Say, there is Which no more sort of for holy years. grail yeah. of, of <laughs> dining reservations that you have to get you know still be our guest and and Cinderella's Royal Table are, are ones that are it's still incredibly popular. But if you aren't able to get that one thing, there's a lot of other equal options that again I think takes away a lot of that disappointment that guests. And then from a culinary perspective, or you know, at least yeah, oh, agreed, a thousand yeah. percent, the yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And again, it attracts an adult visitor. It goes yeah. back to attracting that adult visitor who's not going to plan that deep into a, into their trip, who's may go down on a whim and and really enjoy themselves and have some great right. food. You don't have to. And you know, look, it, it's helpful to, you know, when I say this all the time, for the guests that's never been to Disney World, there's no other place like this on the planet where six months in advance you need to know what you want to eat, where you want to eat it, what <laughs> rides you want to do. Like it it if when you say it out loud to like a sane human being, they're like, you have to do what? I need to figure out what you know, it doesn't make sense, but now that that the sense of urgency and immediacy is there if that's what you want to do, but you if don't you have wanna... to. You're not going to be stuck having chicken nuggets Ooh. if you don't. Not that the, listen, I love a good nugget. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Um... Well, another thing that's important to note is that even the nicest restaurants are pretty tolerant of kids. You know, it, it's not the sort of thing. I mean, there are a few where maybe you don't want to bring your kids, but um even in some of the nicer places, they understand that families are there together and they're pretty tolerant of having children and food that's accessible for them and all of that. Well, there's also wonderful ways to eat that aren't ADRs. I mean, look at all the festivals at Epcot. I mean, if I have friends that are visiting you know, during that time of the year and I see them booking, you know, you know, seated meals for every night of you know, their vacation during food and wine. I'm like, whoa, leave <laughs> yourself a couple days where you're not confined to sitting at a restaurant. You don't want to necessarily, you know, be stuffing yourself at one of the, you know, Epcot yeah. restaurants when I'm, world sh- when food and wine is happening. Grazing or, is the way to go, or, man. I'm still yeah, working yeah. off my food and wine baggage, man. <laughs> I still am. It's, it's bad. That was, that was a tough experience, but I loved every minute of it. That's why you needed those those leggings. Yeah. leggings. <laughs> <laughs> I need a pair of really big stretchy leggings. Um, <laughs> can we get some WW Radio Lula Row ones? Anyway, um, uh, Terry, Terry, I, I want to um, <laughs> I, I want to wrap it up with just a few. These are I, I want to be crystal clear. These are not things that I know or have any prior knowledge of that are going to happen or are going to be announced. These are predictions, wishful thinking, blue sky off the top of purely Disney enthusiast Lou Mangiello's head. Um, first and foremost, and, and I I said this earlier, when I thought about sort of predicting the, the 2018 future, the very first thing that came to my mind was Marvel. Um I think that there are a lot of things going on backstage in terms of planning to have a much stronger, broader, impactful Marvel presence in the parks. Um, I think the first place we're going to see it is in Disneyland, specifically California Adventure. Maybe not um, executed on in 2018 fully, but I think we will see some... We will see. Um, uh, I, I think the, the the timing of Infinity War and Avengers in California. Look, I think the Avengers are coming to Disney California Adventure, so <laughs> that's what I think is happening. But I think it's also going to come in Walt to, to Walt Disney World. Um, 
not necessarily um, this year, but I think we'll get a hint of, of what is to come in the future. Uh, I said this when we were talking about the um, the Fox deal. This is sort of outside the, the scope of the parks, but I think in terms of how it may potentially impact Walt Disney World, um, I believe within the next 12 to 24 months, Disney is going to sell off ESPN. I think they are going yeah. to um, get out of the business, which is currently not just hemorrhaging money, but it's not where Disney is is um, is its strength. I think they can sell it to the right suitor, which will position them, who may be uh, already strong in the sports arena to really – revitalize that brand um i don't think that that was necessarily the one for disney so i think the timing of acquiring fox all those additional sports properties coupled with the the it's not fledgling espn um makes it a perfect package to offload to somebody else um i believe i'll in no particular order um I think that you are going to see, we're talking about IPs before, I think you're going to see more Zootopia in the parks. Um, I think that there are some areas, specifically at Disney's Animal Kingdom, which would be primed and ready for Zootopia to come in. We talked about a uh, a new Magic Kingdom parade. Um, everything old is new again, and... Uh, don't call it a comeback. He's been here for years, but I think you are going to see the return of a character that at one time was positioned to be, for lack of a better word, the next Mickey Mouse or the Mickey Mouse right-hand guy. And when I say Roger Rabbit, you might <laughs> be surprised, but I believe it is the 30th anniversary of Who Framed Roger Rabbit it is a perfect time not to just release the Ultra HD Blu-ray super duper, you know, 18 disc version, but I would not be surprised to see Roger Rabbit make a um, an appearance on Disney Channel, Disney XD, and either simultaneously or uh, based on the response, seeing a return of Roger Rabbit to the parks. And I did a show years ago um, specifically about Roger Rabbit and what plans for him were supposed to be, not just having his own land at Disney's Hollywood Studios where Sunset Boulevard currently sits, but plans for him as a character in the Disney universe. Um, I would not be surprised if they tested the waters to see what, guest interest might be in seeing um, Roger Rabbit return. Um, and I think in terms, I tried to sort of think about the, the Disney parks, specifically Walt Disney World, and I tried to think of a single word that would define what 2018 is going to be. And I think efficiency is going to be um, uh, sort of the, the key word in 2018 for the parks and resorts. I think that we are going to see um, the introduction of as yet never before seen technology in the parks for not just new interactive, but more importantly, personalized guest experiences. We saw a little bit in what I believe was just a, a scratch test of how they can utilize and guest response to personalization. So it's going to go far beyond just seeing your name on a screen as you leave. It's a small world. It's not just going to have your name and hometown on a, a rock concert poster in a rock and roller coaster currently starring Aerosmith. Um, you are going to have a much more personalized experience in the parks, uh, in your resort. Um, and I don't just mean in the Star Wars resort. I think you're going to see it elsewhere. Um, 
I think there is I think technology and the implementation of it is going to be what the game changer is going to be this year. Not technology necessarily in an attraction, but technology in terms of the user experience. Again, Disney has been and is going to continue to collect better information about what it is that we do, what it is that we like, what it is that we want to see. Um, and they're, they're taking you know these quantum levels of data to understand better, not just what we as a collective, as guests like, but more importantly, what we as individuals, what we as families like to do together. Um, and I said before this, and not that you can see, but for those of you watching at home, your mobile device is going to be your key in 2018 and beyond. Years ago, I talked about how I, I didn't like kids in queues looking down at their phones playing video games. I still don't because I want it to be an exp I, look for a lot of families. The only time they get to talk and spend the entire day together is when they go on vacation. So I want them to experience the same things that I did when I went as a kid with my parents. It was the time that you talked and made memories and took pictures and laughed and, and played games and stuff together. But your mobile device now is going to be an integral part, if you want it to be, of your theme park and resort experience. Um, you can interpret that to mean augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, effect, uh, efficiency, um, communication, uh, gamification of your experience in the park. So when I say gamification, I don't mean you download a game and you play it when you're in the car. I mean, it is going to gamify your experience at the parks itself. Um, things like Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom, um, some testing they did a long time ago of sort of interactive AR experiences. I think this is going to be the year that it happens. You don't need to go to a kiosk and grab a flip phone to play the Agent P adventure. You're going to be able to do those things individually and collectively as a family in the parks. So when you do have to potentially wait in line for an attraction, there's going to be something to do. There's going to be a reward at the end. There's going to be something that you can achieve while you're doing it. And your mobile device um, is going to be the key that is going to unlock a lot of these um, technologies and experiences. So um, that is where I think we are going. Uh, I say all the time that when while well, I, I love looking ahead and talking about the things that we know, the thing that excites me the most is the unknown. Um, not knowing what Disney and the Imagineers um, and, and all the creatives have in store for us is the the thing that excites me the most. Um, the the biggest the biggest surprises often come from the biggest surprises, the things that none of us talked about today, the things that nobody has seen coming, um, that all of a sudden they come out of left field and they are they're game changers. So I want to know from you, the listener, what are you most looking forward to in Disney in 2018? It could be the parks, the resorts, the movies, dining, snacking, mobile eating, whatever, dining related or not. I invite you to either call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. Be on the air. Let me hear it. Let me hear that passion in your voice about what new dining experience or experience otherwise that you're excited about. Or go to the WDW Radio Box People group on Facebook. Go to Facebook.com. Sorry, wait. Go to WDWRadio.com slash Box People because we all sort of we, we, you live in this box and uh, be part of the community and the conversation and uh, definitely... Uh, if you're not a member of the group 2018, I've got some things planned specifically for that group that I am excited to roll out in the coming months and maybe weeks. Uh, so I want to thank all of my guests in no particular order other than Ali, Lisa, Chris, Keith, and Jimmy. Thank you guys so very much for sharing your time, your insight, your excitement and enthusiasm about what is to come in the future. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Lou. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. 
Uh, thank Thanks, you for Lou. being. And I promise, boathouse, boathouse for boathouse for everyone. Everyone. <laughs> boathouse for everyone. <laughs> 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 it's time for our Walt Disney World trivia question of the week where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details sometimes what you see, sometimes what you hear, maybe even what you eat. And if you think you know the answer, you can use our online form and enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, we were reflecting back on 2017, starting to look ahead a little bit to what is coming in 2018. And I mentioned how excited I was, and am, for the Skyliner transportation and, I think, attraction system that's coming to Walt Disney World this year. And it made me nostalgic for the old Skyway in Magic Kingdom. And that's why your question was to tell me, what lands did the Skyway connect? First things first, thanks again to the hundreds of you who entered. Not only got this one correct, but some of you who shared some of your favorite memories or favorite views from the old Skyway bucket, as well as the answer that it connected to Morrowland and Fantasyland Rest in peace, Swiss Chalet. I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and again, you were playing for my 102 ways to save money for an at Walt Disney World book, all seven of my virtual audio walking tours of the Magic Kingdom, both of which you can find still on sale for just $10 in the WW Radio shop. I'm also going to send you a WW Radio Magic Band cover, some WW Radio stickers, and the handy-dandy WW Radio pop socket and holder for your phone. And last week's winner... Randomly selected is Angelo Vittorio. So, Angelo, you use the form. I have your address. I'll get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, don't worry, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So we're looking ahead and thinking back, and and I still love those classic attractions in the park, some of which I hope never leave, and one of them, which still remains one of my favorites, is Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. And that is where your question this week comes from, because all I want you to do is tell me, because I know you've seen this attraction dozens, if not hundreds of times, what is the name of the young son in Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress? You have until Sunday, January 1st, to go to www.radio.com, click on the podcast link, this week's episode, and use the online form. And again, you're going to play for the book, audio tours, magic band cover, stickers, pop socket. And you know what? I'm going to throw in a mystery prize from my prize closet in this week's prize package as well. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so very much for spending and sharing your time with me. Just a couple of quick reminders. Don't forget to please go over to Facebook and join and be part of the community and discussion on our Box People group. If you go to www.radio.com slash Box People, it'll take you right there. We'd love for you to not only be part of the conversation, but start discussions of your own as well. I have some neat things planned specifically for our Box People Facebook group coming in the next year. So if you're not a member, please come on and join the community. Also, be sure and check out the WW Radio blog and join me every Wednesday night on Facebook live at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And if you turn on notifications on the WW Radio page, you'll also get notified as I go live, not just on Wednesday nights, but other times from the parks, resorts, and maybe somewhere special next weekend. I want to quickly thank some of the new and longtime members of the WW Radio Nation family. Thanks to all of you who are helping to literally keep the lights on and support the show, including some of our platinum members like Michael Kell, Thomas Zukas, Bob Ostrowski, Eric Covino, Smith Getterman, and Becky Mankin. And if you want to not only help the show, but get exclusive rewards every month, I do monthly scavenger hunts. We have a private Facebook group, custom magic band covers, logo gear, backpacks, care packages from the the parks every month. And you can be part of our live video group calls as well. You can visit www.radio.com slash support. And don't forget that a portion of the proceeds of your contributions do go to our Dream Team project, 
to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. As I've said from show number one, I I really want this to be a two-way conversation between us. That's why I want you to be part of the community in the Facebook group. But if you have a question you want me to answer on the air, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. You can also connect and engage with me on social. I am at Lou Mangello on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And of course, I believe that while connecting and, and communicating back and forth online, is great. Nothing beats a handshake and a hug. That's why I continue and will continue to do Meets of the Month and special events every single month in Walt Disney World. February's is most likely going to be the 11th. Stay tuned for details and location. We still have a few spots remaining for our Alaska cruise this June 18th through the 25th. I also have some other special events planned that we'll announce later on as well as other meetups that I do on the road as I travel to speak. Uh, I will be speaking February 8th through the 10th right here in Orlando at PodFest. I'll be the closing keynote speaker there. If you go to lumangelo.com slash PodFest, you can find out more. And I would love to be able to help you, whether it's coming to speak to your business virtually or in person at your event or conference or helping you build your own business and brand and turn that thing that you love into that thing that you do. You can find out more by visiting loumangelo.com. Thanks, as always, to Becky Mankin and her entire team over at mousefantravel.com. No matter what Disney or other destination you are going to, they will give you incredible pricing, all available discounts, help you along the way, all at no cost to you. You can visit them over at mousefantravel.com and then go to celebrationspress.com and subscribe and order back issues to Celebrations Magazine. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is to please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Share a link to this or one of your favorite back episodes with your friends on Facebook. Invite them to be part of the community and the family. And if you can, take just 30 seconds to rate and review the show over on iTunes. It's incredibly helpful. I want to thank some recent reviewers like Matt Tenor One, who says, The podcast makes me feel like I'm at Disney exactly what I want to do, Matt. Awesome. It's wonderful to have such a positive and informative host in Lou. He seems to be a very genuine person. Oh, thanks. What he, 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 who does what he loves and uses his influence to bring the magic to all of us here around the world. Goofy Doc says, positively, Lou, there is nobody who makes me happier to be a podcast listener than Lou. He is passionately positive about one of my favorite topics, which is all things Disney. He informs and entertains with every episode. In addition, he's truly a nice person who means it when he says you're his friend, whether we have met yet or not. It's true. When you do meet him, and you should, you'll find him surrounded by friends and family who make you feel like you belong with them, because you do. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the WW Radio podcast. You can thank me when we're standing in line together at a meet of the month or waiting with the WW running team for the start of a race or any time we might encounter one another as part of this wonderful wonderful community created by and around Lou Mangello. Wow, Goofy Doc, that's so nice. And Charlie River says, this is the best Disney podcast. It's thoroughly entertaining, enlightening, and educational. It's perfect. Lou Mangello will become your new best friend. Charlie and Goofy Doc and Matt, I appreciate uh, that so very much. And it is true about this community that you guys have created and the friendship that we have, whether we have met yet or not. So if you want to leave a review, you can go to iTunes and search for WW Radio or just go to www.radio.com slash iTunes and it'll take you right there as well. Thank you again so very much for your time, the love, the support, and most importantly, the friendship that you have extended to me. I appreciate you so very much. And this week, today, every day, Go out and do something good, not just for yourself, but for somebody else. Imagine if everybody did one thing every day to make the life of somebody around them a little bit better. Just imagine how much happier everybody, including you, would be. I hope that this is your very best week ever. Thank you so very much. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, it's Ryan Hurley. Uh, I just wanted to call in and say uh, that the uh, Tokyo Disneyland and Tokyo Disney Sea show is fantastic. Um, I think y'all you, you did a fantastic job of of uh, covering um, the, the idiosyncrasies, if you will, of uh, those parks and, and also uh, just explaining how special they are. Um, 
I was able to uh, to visit both parks. I think it was three years ago, and uh, I wanted to add a couple of, of little tidbits. Um, the first is that if um, if you see huge crowds, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, it's a very uh, popular park, especially on the weekends, because obviously Tokyo is a giant city. Uh, but uh, the crowd management there is. Um, better than I've ever seen any crowd management in the world. Uh, so um, if you see uh, literally thousands of people uh, outside at Rope Drop, don't worry about it. Uh, and the second thing, too, is that if you are unable to stay at one of the local uh, Disney resorts uh, right there, um, don't worry about that either. Uh, I was staying at a, uh, at a Marriott, I think um, is what it was, um, in like downtown Tokyo. And the the transit system uh, throughout Tokyo is, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, world renowned. So uh, it was very easy to get there um, using the, the train system. And then uh, it, it actually drops off right at the monorail station. And then you get on the monorail to uh, bring you to uh, the park. So, uh, yeah, so just want to add those uh, little tidbits, and uh, yeah, I definitely need to go back as well. So uh, I hope to see you soon. Uh, bring uh, bring the wife and the baby by uh, at the uh, one of the meetups soon. See you soon, bud. Hey, Lou. This is Christine Morrison calling from Flower Town, PA, and I just finished listening to um, your number five hundred five with Becky reviewing um, some listener emails, and then you wanted us to call in or tweet or Facebook you about movies that we thought Walt would have enjoyed. Um, So I started thinking about it, and um, there's actually four that um, I think I could recite word for word every the dialogue to all of them and the music and have actually um, confessed that I have stood in my bedroom as a teenager um, singing these and dancing to these in front of the mirror. Um, My first and foremost is The Little Mermaid, um, my favorite, favorite movie uh, growing up. Then Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Lion King. Those four, um, it was an amazing, amazing time in Disney animated cinematic universe. And um, I think that he would have just loved, loved, loved all four of those. Um, And then my favorite, favorite funny movie of all time, which I don't think gets enough credit, but every time I watch it, I'm cracking up and I never get tired of it, is Emperor's New Groove. Um, I think it's hilarious, and my kids love it, and even Kronk's New Groove is pretty pretty funny, too. But um, we just love all the banter and the one-liners and the comedy in that movie is hilarious. So if you haven't seen it, you need to go watch it. But um, anyway, that's my two cents worth, and have a wonderful, wonderful week. And um, I will see you all in the box next Wednesday. Adios. Bye-bye. Hi, Lou. This is Derek from Albuquerque. My wife and I just returned from WW Marathon Weekend, and I listened to your most recent listener email episode. I had a couple comments for you. First of all, thank you so much to you and everyone else for all your cheering during the weekend. We saw you when we ran the 10K. We were Mushu and Mulan, and I think I startled you on the boardwalk when I yelled at your name. Then we were actually cheering beside you in the Epcot bus parking lot for the half marathon. Didn't see you during the full marathon, but I saw plenty of WDW Radio Nation uh, fans and signs throughout the course. So thank you to you and everyone for all your support. Uh, it's greatly appreciated to all of us runners. Second, I'm not going to ask the question about what movie I think Walt Disney would like, but you asked earlier on your episode about what attraction you would take someone to on their first visit to Walt Disney World. And I don't have an answer to that either. However, I can tell you what not to do. Uh, about 15 years ago, my wife and I took my brother and sister-in-law to w- to Walt Disney World for their first trip, and, for her first trip anyway, and uh, we took her on Tower of Terror as her first ride. And uh, needs to say, after that, she never trusted us again for the entire week. So I do not recommend taking someone on Tower of Terror for the first uh, attraction at Walt Disney World. 
Thank you again for all you do. Really appreciate uh, all your work and love listening to you every week. We will see you sometime soon, I'm sure. Take care. Bye. Hello, Lou Mangiello. It's Sterling Nagy from West Seneca, New York, and I'm calling in to say congratulations to all the WDW running team for running the 5K, the 10K, the half, the full, the dopey. Oh, my goodness, that was awesome. Love seeing all the pictures. Thank you for including us, everyone. And I want to say I'm 127 days out to my birthday trip in Walt Disney World. I cannot wait to be at Flower and Garden and see all the topiaries and taste the food that they have at that event. We're staying at the boardwalk, so I am thrilled. Then Lou Mangello's WDW Radio Cruise to Alaska is 156 days away. I know there's planning going on because Becky Mankin said so. And 158 days now until my besties, my family, the Sternbergs, and us go down to the world together. It's going to be so much fun. Everybody, Stay warm. We're back in a freeze. We got snow and ice yesterday. It's 14 degrees. And Orlando is at least back in the 50s today, almost 60. Have a really great weekend. Stay safe and love you all. You got a friend in me. Yeah. Nemo, newcomer of orange and white, you have been called forth to the summit of Mount Wanahakalugi to join with us in the fraternal bonds of tankhood. Huh? We want you in our club, kid.